Yeah, well, welcome everyone to the Medevac Podcast. Uh, my name is Christian Myers. I'm one of your hosts today, joined by David Reed. Before we hop into our guests, just want to remind you guys, we do not do any advertisements here at the Medevac Podcast for a specific reason. We don't want to inundate you guys. All we ask is that if you get something out of the show, please share it on uh, social media, friends, family, however you want. So if you get one thing from this today, please share it. Push the like button. One person, yeah. And ask Dave a question in the comments. Ask me a question. I'm ready. I'm ready, guys, for any question. Anything. We got a great guest today, don't we? We do. We have Colonel Don Crawford today. D.O. A doctor. Dr. Vostopathic Medicine. That's it. And and a West Point infantry officer as well. Commissioned, right? right? How do you properly say it? What's... Give, give us the breakdown. I'm not a doctor. I was an enlisted guy, so let's just start easy and go from there. It's very very I, simple. I attended very West simple. Point. I actually graduated from it, and uh, upon graduation, uh, I was commissioned a second lieutenant in the Army, the okay. regular Army. Um, like, what made you want to go into the military in the beginning? Uh, two primary drivers. Uh, I was always a big history buff, and uh, you know, I it was always my favorite classes, world history, history of warfare, and mm. American history, and that sort of thing. And one of the common denominators when you're reading through American history and you're looking at the presidents and the people that shaped history, mm-hmm. um, the, a significant number of them attended West Point. Yeah. And I kind of got interested in it and what kind of place that it was. And then uh, on top of that, uh, you know, my dad was a school teacher and my mom was a stay-at-home mom. And my older brother went to a private college two years ahead of me and mom had gone back to work and things were tight. And, you know, I'm not going to lie and say that the fact that West Point was a fully funded education. <laughs> yeah. uh, With a small commitment at the end, right? It yeah, is a the, small the five, commitment. The five-year commitment, which stretched to 30 for me. So. <laughs> now, let me ask you this question. Did you have the facial hair back then? Because I feel like that's standard issue when it comes to Don Crawford. <laughs> I did not. I actually, had, I actually had hair on top of my head back oh, then. Oh, you switched. It reversed. Yeah. And, uh, who knows yeah. Cool. I have to have something to play with, you know? Yeah, no, it's great. So, so, so right here. So you, did you know what you wanted to do when you went in to West Point? I did. Um, I, all the other schools I applied to out of high school were schools that kind of focused on pre-med. Okay. And uh, so I was, I, I was kind of interested in becoming a physician at that time. And I also was very open to the idea of becoming a professional soldier and, and combining the two. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so... What I didn't realize is when I got to West Point that uh, to directly go to medical school out of West Point, um, you have to be in the top 2% of your class. And uh, if you look at the quality of people that they take into that institution, uh, being in the top 2% is some very thin air. Yeah, I bet. I I did not uh, personally uh, attain that uh, elevation. Uh, <laughs> At least you matter, knew yourself, a, right? As a matter of fact, the uh, the repetitive D's in calculus. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, so uh, kind of thinned that uh, that thought down pretty quickly for me. So I uh, I actually opted to go into the infantry because my my father had been an infantry uh, platoon sergeant in the Korean War in okay. the uh, Ninth Infantry Regiment. Yeah, family and, uh, history there too. Yeah, kind yeah. And, that. Uh, I mean, like I said, my dad my dad had been a soldier and. Uh, just for four years, but it, it, it kind of carried over and the, all of my, I grew up in one of those neighborhoods in South Pittsburgh where every one of your neighbors is your uncle oh, and yeah. they all have permission to smack you around if you get stupid. <laughs> and, uh, it's I a just, good way to do it. <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, it takes a village, yeah, right? It takes, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, it takes a village for you. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, the, uh, all of my uncles, you know, all, all the people my dad hung out with, I mean, uh, my Uncle John Neal uh, had almost lost his legs on Iwo Jima. He was yeah. a Marine corporal, and you know a shell landed in the foxhole on the beach that he was in. Um, wow. Jim Banner, who lived across the street from me, was a, a Marine that won the Silver Star and a Purple Heart uh, in the retreat from the Chozon Reservoir, wow. uh, running yeah. uh, you know running machine gun ammunition back and forth to the guns covering the retreat. Yeah. Um, and that's just the kind of the um, environment I grew up in in uh, in in. in uh, in Pittsburgh. So it was, it was definitely a pro, uh, a patriotic and a pro uh, military kind of environment that so, I grew up in. So service yeah. to country was instilled yeah. within you at a very young age. Yep. You were very used to that. It, it was, it was kind of expected that you served. Yeah. Uh, if, if there was a need. Sounds like yeah. there's a lot of positive influences behind that though. I mean, seeing guys mm-hmm. who have 
done done the real deal. I mean, winning a silver star in World War II, that's pretty yeah. significant. And, and first of all, we didn't say a year that you you attended West Point. What year did you attend West Point? I was at West Point from 1983 to 1987. So before it all, uh, before 9-11 and all that stuff. So yep, I did it of my own free will. Desert storm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So where did you all start? Like once um, you got to your unit, which was? I, uh, after graduation from the academy, uh, you know, we went to officer basic course. Um, and then all of the infantry officers were, you know, you had a two day break and you started and went to ranger school. And, uh, yep. Back then I, we still delineated the, uh, some, the, the summer rangers from the winter rangers. Uh, so, <laughs> and you were a winter ranger, yeah, right? We, we began, uh, I, Dave's a winter I, ranger. I, can't, I can't remember my own kids' names, but I remember that day we started on November 3rd. So first and foremost, <laughs> rangers lead the way. Uh, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, so, and then Ranger School for you, so it was pretty, pretty uh, close to the beginning of your career. Correct. And for all of you guys who don't know, there, there's three phases for the modern Ranger, but you did four we phases. Did four. Desert phase. Was, was, we still had the desert phase. Mm. Yes. So we had the, you know, the city week, and then you had the mountains, and you had the desert, and you had the, the uh, jungle phase or the Florida phase. So is this a whole, like, another month longer or something? No, actually, we were phase? shorter than oh, they okay. are now. Okay. Uh, we were 58 days. Um, okay. And uh, it was the, uh, you know, Jenny Craig should have such a diet plan. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Lose uh, weight. I know. Lose but, weight. Yeah, but on top days. of that, it's like maybe not the best diet plan because I came out of that with an Ethiopian belly yeah. after that. Lost I, like 30 pounds. I, I, I actually, I, I, everybody always asks how much weight do you lose in ranger school? And I say, all of it. Yeah. All, yeah. Of, your, <laughs> all of your weight. Everything that you can lose, they take away from yeah. you. Yeah. Muscle, uh, fat, yeah, whatever. everything. Uh, I mean, I was, you know, I, I was into, you know, bodybuilding and weightlifting and stuff like that. I went in at 188 and I legitimately graduated at 138. Oh, shit. Uh, uh, but everybody in the lines at graduation, we all looked the same. Yeah. Yeah. It was the same cadaverous, <laughs> <laughs> swaying in the wind. <laughs> we, we, were, we, were, uh, we, we were all stood up to be extras on Night of the Walking Dead. Yeah, you know? they, they had a wind notice out upon graduation because <laughs> yeah. you just blow right over yeah. huh? 25 oh, no, mile yeah, an hour. I just remember <laughs> it was, graduation was in January. It was really cold at Fort Benning. And we're watching, we're, we're all standing out there in OG 107s and t shirts and we're looking at the stands and everybody's bundled up and shivering and shaking. And we're just kind of like, yep. Yeah. You got to embrace the suck at That's some it. point, right? It's just, you know, you just got to keep walking. <laughs> and, I've never uh, met a mindset besides Rangers who want things to suck more. Seems, it, it, it seems yeah. like a trend with you guys. Well, I always joke Doesn't about Ranger enough. School is because we were so glucose deprived and mm. so sleep deprived that anybody from my, my era, we we remember very little of it. Oh yeah, I mean it, it really is kind of scary. Laps in memory. How little, but you, you develop this muscle memory, and you just realize that when you get to your unit and you're going out on a patrol, and okay, that's right, that's not right. We do this, we don't do that, and it's it's just ingrained into your subconscious. Yeah, but your your conscious memories of it are almost non-existent because Interesting. you. I mean, you, you, other people over the years have come up and told me funny stories about stupid shit I did. In yeah, Ranger yeah, School, and yeah. I'm like, oh yeah, right, sure. Like, <laughs> yeah, I remember <laughs> that, that one. Yeah, yeah sure. I remember when that freaking purple alligator uh, came out of the tree yeah, line. Yeah, and no shit. Trying I, to take my leg, walking yeah. off a cliff almost daily. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and uh, but we, like I said, you don't remember very much, but your body and your subconscious are kind of trained to, to a certain standard. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, and you know, people always ask, and I'm sure Dave recalls, uh, you know. The, the, the net benefit of Ranger School for me is I have never taken a hot shower, had a good meal, uh, been in a nice, comfortable chair, and not appreciated it more than any other man on the planet. Yeah, agree with that. You know, it's, uh, it is a, it's, I, I always call it a course in life appreciation. Yep, absolutely. We've, you know? we've talked about this on pretty much every episode, that it's yeah. important to have negative experiences so you can relish the positive ones. Yeah, right. you gotta, you gotta yeah. face some adversities in life to yeah. appreciate the good stuff, right? Yeah. And, 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 and it, it also strips away any of the uh, preconceptions you have of, you know, what, what, what you're willing and not willing to do to be warm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> willing to do anything. I will do anything and hug any man to stay warm. <laughs> I, 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 I'll, throw, I'll throw one of my closest friends under the bus. I mean, he, he's a, just a brilliant guy. He's a Stanford PhD now, but he was a, um, he was with us in Korea, and he was also a range, went to the Ranger Battalions. He was a field artillery officer that became an infantry officer okay. that became a special forces officer. His name was Joe Felter. Wow. And uh, he was our forward, air, forward, forward support officer um, 
for, for fires. And we were on Team Spirit. And Dave Grange, our battalion commander, who was probably the toughest individual human being I've ever known in my entire life, uh, mentally, physically, in every capacity, uh, decided that we were going to do this like 20 kilometer nighttime infiltration through the mountains of Korea into the enemy rear and set up a what was called a GLID back then, which was just a laser identifier for the artillery okay. on this hilltop. Yep. So we start this battalion sized movement down these ridge lines and we end up on the objective with. Yeah, battalion sized movement is right. massive. It is. The coordination behind that is. Uh, just, and, and, and the worst yeah. part of it was we lost so many people en route and they were just strung out across the Korean hillsides. Uh, you know, we ended up with about a company size element making the objective. What's the they difference be- between these two sizes? I'm Air Force by, for <laughs> reference. <laughs> a company's about 100, 120 men. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, you know, full, a full battalion with all the ancillary staff and everything. We have probably six to 700 marching guys. Shit, that's Range a of battalions movement. are a little bigger. We're a little better filled out. Yeah. As far as manning and staff. If it was a ranger battalion moving on, I couldn't imagine that. 700 (laughs) rangers. It was kind of a ranger mission though. Yeah. But the, uh, we got to the uh, objective on this hilltop and it's, you know, it's below zero. We're, you know, way up Mm. in the mountains of Korea and everything like that. And all the men are digging in and we're waiting for team spirit to, you know, kick off and the enemy to start coming down the road and we're doing sleep cycles and everybody's just freezing to death. And, uh, so Felter and I, we, uh, we had just graduated from ranger school, you know, like two months prior to this. So you're used to, you're like, yeah, this is nothing. It, 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 it was something. It was something. <laughs> it's, it's we, we, we were cold again. Yeah, it was something. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was hilarious because his, uh, his fire support element and my platoon were together dug in on this mountaintop. And uh, the, first, the first night we were up there, um, you know, when we, when we finally got some sleep, you know, Joe and I were in the same foxhole because we were kind of the command element. and. Uh, you know, when it was time to sleep, we we did like we did in ranger school. We laid a poncho, line, you know, poncho and poncho liner on the ground and covered up. And we were spooning like, you know, <laughs> you know, two very close friends. <laughs> two, two close spoons. Yeah. We were spooning like two close spoons. You know, and, and, you it's know, for survival. Course, yeah. Well, we didn't even think twice about it. Oh, yeah. You know, but the next, you Doesn't know, come daylight and everything like that, all the men are kind of chuckling and giggling and, you know, yeah. making fun and poking fun and everything <laughs> like that. And we're looking at them like, what? And it's like. You know, it's the best way to stay warm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, uh, when you're in these kind of circumstances. You're and everything laughing like that. back at them. I was warm last yeah, night. I felt, I felt yeah, very, very, some... very nice and warm and yeah. toasty. You know, it's... Uh, and who is the big spoon? And was who was... <laughs> you were obviously <laughs> the big spoon, right? Yeah, I was a little bigger. Uh, the, uh, uh, but uh, Joe was a very good looking man. Uh-huh. <laughs> makes it worthwhile then. <laughs> uh, but the, uh, um, the funny thing is that the next night we're out you know, I'm walking the perimeter and checking all the foxholes and everything like that. And three men in a hole, two are trying to sleep. And every hole we went to, uh, and we're checking on our guys, they're all, all the men in there are spooning. Yeah. I say like, they learned their lesson real quick. Yeah. yeah. It was, you know, it was okay. Yeah, and that, that's a funny thing too, yeah. right? Is, is you could laugh and joke about it. Right. But at the end of the day, practicality becomes paramount. Well, yeah, it, imagine pride getting in the way of your survival. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Maslow's hierarchy, you know, food, <laughs> sleep. They, they trump everything. Yeah. You know, it does. and when you're, when you're cold and there's the ability to get warm, you know, like I said, cold, you, hungry, yeah, yeah. you know, you just throw wet into that and, the, and, oh, and it's, Jesus. it's a, whole yeah, new, that's, a whole new level of misery. Yeah. <laughs> the ultimate trifecta right yeah, there. That's it. But that, you know, it, it's an interesting point that you bring up too. And I, I think it's important for our listeners out there is, you know, it's all, it's not all glamorous, right? It's not all call of duty. It's not all running and gunning. Like you're getting, you're taking the time to get to, to that objective and you're marching out there. You're going miles and miles with hundreds of pounds of gear on and embracing the suck. Oh yeah. You know, I mean. And it was amazing. I mean, they, the, the infantry soldiers in Korea were basically mules, human pack mules. Man. Because we carried our houses on our back and yeah. y- you were, you were headed one of two directions, straight up or straight down because mm-hmm. there was no. Flatland walking over there. There's yeah. Either of light- which is fun. There's yeah. no lightweight equipment really then either. I mean, no, it was the- all heavy wool and you know yeah. canvas. Yeah, type and of it, that's the balance too. I was I was bring that up too. Is you know yeah, when Gore-Tex I was Gore-Tex was a whole new. Concept. Yeah. Oh yeah, that would have <laughs> yeah. been lovely to have back then, right? <laughs> but I always bring that up too. Is like you know you have to you have to find a balance, right? You could either be warm, you know, on the mm. march out there, but you know by stripping down and not oh. having layers on. Yep. But then you get to your objective and you're freezing cold. <laughs> yeah, but if you, you have can... to, if you have something warm to dry to put on out of your backpack, that's 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 important. Yeah, I mean that was you know that was one of the ranger school things that you know you learned is 
when you were moving, you were stripped down to just, you stayed warm by moving. Yeah. Yep. And, you know, a lot of guys would start out with, you know, a lot of clothes on because they were cold, but they'd be sweating through everything within, you know, the first two clicks yep. of uh, going up and down. That's and it. just one of those experiences that you learn that, yep, you're going to be cold before you get started, but you'll warm up quickly. And, yep. mm -hmm. and then, really and truly, it is all about staying dry or having something dry to put on. Yeah. It's change of socks is yeah. very, very important. Dry socks. Yeah. Dry socks. So that was your, your experience in Korea. So yeah. how did that, how did that, the rest of that mission go? Well, uh, it, 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 it ended up with almost a uh, huge fist fight between us and the uh, op four <laughs> Koreans that the, because we, we obliterated like a division of uh, armor coming down the road and they were very upset about that because <laughs> to the South, well, seriously, I mean, you yeah. call it in and the observer controllers are just saying, yeah, you guys are all dead, all of you, everybody, you know, because, <laughs> you know, they're bringing in one five fives, eight inch, everything in the world is raining down on you right now. And, uh, you know, I, I think in the Korean army at that time, you know, not doing well in team spirit, which was there, I mean, was catamount to, you know, writing yourself out of a, a professional career in the military. I mean, it was a very wow. big deal to them yeah. uh, and everything like that. And to be obliterated before they even got to the line of demarcation. <laughs> uh, so needless to say, there was a, when they, they were upset with us and there was a, a bit of a confrontation there down in the, on the road when we were all leaving. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, the best thing to do when you get into fight is just, uh, and, and Christian could attest to this, is just strip naked, right? Pull, pull your pants down, yeah. You, know, they, you can't fight crazy, right? You can't. <laughs> He's like, I don't know what to say about that. I, I don't know. We were, we, were, we were pretty ingenious. I mean, we, we were taking out e-tools and flashbangs. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we're batting them at it. We're going to win this too, don't worry. We yeah. just won that. We're going to win this too. Oh, don't no, we were going to lose miserably. Oh. <laughs> uh. <laughs> So how did you end up at Ranger Battalion? Um, once again, I, Colonel Dave Grange, uh, one of the greatest Americans I've ever known or served, um, was my battalion commander. Mm -hmm. I was very new to the Army, didn't really understand how it worked. Um, but uh, apparently uh, he had, um, after his infantry command in Korea, I, I believe he was already pre-slotted to come back and command a Ranger Battalion. Mm -hmm. um, and the Rangers recruit heavily out of Korea because the officers all have a year of experience, a lot of DMZ time, mm -hmm. kind of experience they're looking for. Because the Rangers don't take guys right out of the commissioning or right out of um, officer base, of course. Okay. Um, they want and a field experience. The, the, only, the only lieutenant I ever heard of that going to the Ranger Regiment uh, straight out of the officer base, of course, uh, was, uh, was a prior Ranger NCO that had gone through, like, I believe, E7 mm -hmm. in, in the regiment. And they, and they said, ah, you know what? I think he probably has the experience. Has combat experience. <laughs> yeah. enough to, he so, knows how but, to be and, and rightfully so. But for the vast majority of us, uh, you have to serve someplace else, the 82nd Iron First, another infantry unit. And then uh, you apply to the, you apply to the Rangers and you get interviewed. And um, then if they selected through that, you have to come back and back in those days, we called it the rope Ranger orientation program. Mm -hmm. And that was for um, all the senior, the NCOs and officers returning to regiment or new to regiment okay. that already had Ranger tabs. Yeah. That so it was uh how did that interview go with you? Like it was, it was an interesting interview uh, yeah. because um, I was the scout platoon leader at that time in Korea, and um, I was very happy as a leg ranger. Uh, I, I had done my five jumps, and uh, I swore to God I would never leave the earth again. Because and you're, <laughs> wait a minute, we got <laughs> something you mentioned before the show. This guy's afraid of heights. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I am. Uh, heights and snakes, two things that rangers should not be afraid of. <laughs> like Indiana uh, Jones. Yeah, yeah, I do not like snakes. Indiana Jones this is a great... <laughs> and uh, and uh, I, uh, I, did not, I did not like heights. And, but, you know, so I, that initial jump for you in airborne school must oh, have been, yeah. like, how did you get out of the plane for that one? Uh, you know how it is. You're in that stack. And whether if you want to stop or not, you you're, know, pushing you're, 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 yeah. you're a sardine <laughs> in the middle of the pack and you're going out the yeah. door. It's, I mean, it's, a boot to the you know, ass. What's yeah. that? Getting a boot to the ass. That's Get it. out of my plane. And okay. as an officer, too, if you do not jump, if you know, go jump. Jump refusal is a absolute, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolute yeah. out. And, yeah. and you, don't, no, you don't want to do that. There's no appeal to that. Yeah. You don't want to do jump that refusal. anyways. Um, but I, I, I was not big on heights. I had fully expected to do my career in the infantry and in non-special operations or non-airborne units uh, okay. by choice. And uh, the, uh, but we went back to the, uh, Manchu's uh, officers club and they, all three of the battalions had tables set up and I remember the sergeant major who'd come from the ranger regiment as you walked up to the door he'd tell you which table to go sit down at and uh, his name was Jesse Lay another amazing you know, American I'm honored to have served with 
And I walked up to him and he said, all right, Lieutenant Crawford, you go to um, Captain Longenecker on the first table. And I said, all right, Sergeant Major. And uh, I went over to the table and the, the, uh, he was the S1 from First Ranger at the time. He asked me, all right, Lieutenant, why do you want to be an Army Ranger? And I said, well, sir, if I actually wanted to be an Army Ranger, which I don't, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it would be because you guys are absolutely the best infantry in the world. Yeah. Um, and, you know, nobody can do what you guys do. And, you know, my, my father still tells me to this day stories of Ranger Elements rescuing his platoon when it was cut off after uh, attacks in the Korean mountains. And I, I understood who the Rangers were and what they did in their history. Yeah. It's just, I had that little hiccup with the whole leaving the ground thing. <laughs> the whole airborne and, uh, part I, I of it. The whole was, jumping out of a perfectly good airplane. Yeah, I was not set up for success on that. Um, <laughs> did you tell him that at the interview? I, uh, <laughs> Leave that one out. No, because I, as soon as I said what I said, you know, that first sentence to him, and he, he just kind of looked at me and he said, well, I appreciate, you know, like your honesty and thank you for coming. And, uh, you know, they're having steaks and beer behind us at the, uh, in the restaurant, you know, help yourself sort of thing. And A, it was Korea. I mean, I was on the DMZ at the time. Yeah. I, 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 I levitated, you know, to the back of the officer's club for food and beer. <laughs> they gave me uh, some steaks and beer, yeah. And everything like that. And, um, but once again, it's an education in the Army. And I didn't realize that uh, prior to that interview, the interview for the Ranger Regiment was everything we had done in that battalion up to that point. Uh, yeah. It had nothing to do with what we sat at that table. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, we had, uh, you know, a battalion commander that's part of Ranger history. And we had a sergeant major that was probably the youngest sergeant major in the Army that had grown up in 1st Ranger Battalion. And they had evaluated all the lieutenants and they had already determined who they were sending back and, uh, and who they weren't. They just mm-hmm. wanted to talk to you guys just, at the it, end. It was just, I, I think it really was just a, um, for all the guys that weren't selected, it was just a uh, perfunctory, um, you know, we're doing the right thing and the yeah. interview and everything like that. And I just remember, I don't know, it was like a week, month later, we got these little cards in the mail that, you know, kind of said either welcome to or thank you for having applied, but at this time we don't have need of your services type of card. Yeah. It was a postcard. Was this before emails? <laughs> Long before email. <laughs> that, was, that was it. There was one phone in the company area and that was it. This is by a carrier on uh, a pony. That's it. <laughs> Uh, the runners were still in effect back then when yeah. the radios were so, dead. So you get accepted, and what's your initial thoughts opening that letter when you when it says was, welcome? It, it was written on the outside of it, so everybody and the brother knew whether or not you. I just remember I I, I knew what it said was going to say because I you know I had told them I didn't really want to come. And, <laughs> of course, when you, uh, you don't want to do something, they're like, you know, let's there, jump there on that opportunity. There was a bunch of guys yeah. there. Uh, you know, there was a bunch of guys there that really really wanted to uh, you know serve in the regiment. Sure, and. Uh, I felt horrible that, you know, some of them that really wanted to go weren't selected. And then there was, you know, doorknobs like me that didn't, you know, think that they were going to be successful there. I think I think that has a huge part to do with, uh, you know, you were not there for the, the glamorous aspect of it. You know, you you are a true officer and you recognize this is probably not the place to be, but that's probably why you got in. More than likely. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, the uh, ability over desire. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know. But um like I said, the decision was made, I think, before we sat at that table. Yeah. yeah. And um, my understanding was uh, Colonel Grange was supposed to come back to command 1st Battalion. Um, and he sent a bunch of us to 1st Battalion. And then there was a bunch of guys sent to 3rd Battalion. And I don't think a single guy was sent to 2nd Battalion. And I don't know if that was the old, uh, I know you're a 2nd back guy, Dave, but we, we uh-huh. they, you know, tree huggers. and We know, are tree do, huggers, do, do, do yeah. smokers up the there. hippie. Pacific, the hippies. Pacific Northwest. Uh, you know, first, aren't that? you guys a bunch of beach boys? Wait a minute. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they, they actually had so, a different name for first bad back then those days. What is it? I want to hear it. Oh, it was a... Uh, it was, <laughs> Derogatory? Yeah, kind of like a stormtrooper. Like uh, uh, First bat was considered very, very... Uh, I'll use the word disciplined and rigid. Yeah. And, uh, you know, very, very focused. Um, not, not always the best of things, but, you know, yeah, it, sure. it was their kind of their... Trademark, yeah, that they were the, and then the they were the first guys. battalion. You guys are crunchy yeah, granola tight. rangers, <laughs> <laughs> and we're just the crunchy granola eaters over there yeah, in Birkenstocks. Oh, everything. way on yonder in Washington. But I, I do remember, I you know, because I you know got sent back and I was at rope and we were going up for a reorientation jump and I there was this enormous E six. He was coming back from the uh, Ranger Training Brigade to battalion. I think it was going back to third battalion, and I mean he he had to be six foot three, two hundred forty pounds, two hundred fifty pounds, and I just turned around and I asked him, Sergeant, I would really appreciate it if you make sure I leave this airplane. (laughs) (laughs) 
and and he did. <laughs> Roger that, sir. <laughs> and, uh, probably a little too enthusiastically, <laughs> but uh, no, he was a great guy. I mean, he, but I guess the fear in my eyes and the rotary, and I st- you know, my eyes were probably spinning yeah. with uh, you know the, and I was probably hyperventilating as I from from the terror racing through my veins and back in an aircraft again. Got the Elvis and, foot going. And, yeah, and, and Rangers across. love to jump. Rangers <laughs> love to jump. Oh. oh. Apparently not all of them. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, uh, it, overall, like, we're jumping all the time. Yeah. You're consistently jumping yeah, all the there, time. There are, there are some jumps that are better than other jumps. Absolutely. You know. Hollywood um, jumps. Absolutely. <laughs> Hollywood jump. Yeah, that's, that no, was Matt, a no joke. No please. <laughs> Did that once. You know, back, back when I was in first bat, the, uh, the, uh, the regimental commander at the time, um, did not really believe that Rangers were going to jump out of helicopters into combat. We were going to do mass tactical. That was a, so we didn't do like rotary wing jumps or, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. small, small level jumps. It was all nighttime mass tacks. And yeah. one of the primary missions as in like Panama and uh, other places was uh, airfield seizures. So yep. we, we jumped airfields all the time. Yep. And that's a shit show all in itself. Yeah. I mean, there's so many obstacles on the ground, the asphalt, the, you know, the casualty rate was oh, just. Yeah. yeah. And then you yeah. get stuck in the, the, uh, electrical super. lines. And oh yeah, jump into trees and you like what? You lose like thirty percent of the rangers on the ground. Yeah, the, the only thing oh that God. had a higher fatality rate or or injury rate was probably fast roping, which was another you know just validation of gravity, which was going to work whether we practiced <laughs> it, it or works. not. <laughs> you know, it like, works. You know, and uh, but no, but that was it was the uh, um. So jumping was not. I mean, like I said, it, it was it was always fairly high risk and was night you know nighttime mass tech with. Uh, 100 pounds of gear on, 150 yeah, pounds of gear on. Yeah, everything on. And it was, there was a special treat back then because this was, we had satellite radios back then that were, oh. about, that were about the size of, you know, they were enormous radios, yeah, not yeah. the little. The size of a backpack. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, they feel, you know, and your, your RTOs carried them, but somewhere some really wily, smart NCO said, you know what, the, the platoon leader should not be separated from the SATCOM oh, no. during airborne <laughs> operations. So we, we swapped rucks with our RTOs. And we got to jump the SATCOMs back then. And uh, you, you couldn't lower the SATCOM. Yeah. You had so to, you're riding you, that in. You had to ride the SATCOM oh. in. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah, it that's was. Funny. That was a perfect setup for... And that's right in between your legs for all you guys who haven't jumped before. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that was a unique... 80 uh, pounds of metal in between your legs. Yeah, it, 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 there was, like I said, there was a very good chance of, you know, injury. Yeah. If the, you know, if the wind wasn't just right or if oh, you yeah. hit a groundhog hole on the ground or a rock or... Anything coming in, uh, you know, difficult you, to PLF when you're, uh, yeah, when you got something that big in between yeah, your legs. You, you were mostly a human lawn dart, you know, yeah. with, with that thing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so you just thump, thump, you know, and if you could walk afterwards, it was, you know, a fantastic jump. So, yeah. so no more jumping for you now? Oh, heavens no. My son wants to go skydiving and, and I'm just like, yeah, I've done that. Yeah, not, not, I'm a tandem instructor. If you want to go yeah, jump, I'll, I'll strap uh, you to the front yeah, of me. I appreciate we'll go, that. Let's go jump I'm out just of the plane. Give you a plate. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, how many deployments did you do as a, you know, as an infantry officer with Ranger Regiment? Uh, you know, all the all the standard ones. Um, you know, we, I was in the regiment during the uh, desert first Desert Storm, mm-hmm. and uh, the the regiment was predominantly uh, we had. Missions that we trained for, but we were prominently not deployed uh, yeah. during that that era. Uh, actually, only one uh, one company, B Company First Bat, went over during the actual kickoff of Desert Storm. The rest of us trained and trained and trained for like deep strike missions. I mean, and you know, all of the predominant range of missions because when the ground war kicked off and all those uh, mechanized infantry. But, you know, divisions were racing across the desert at 40 kilometers an hour. Um, you know, like, the, the objectives they thought they were going to be taken down behind enemy lines were, you know, 30 kilometers behind friendly lines, you yeah. know, two hours into the war. You know, so it was just the, the, the pace that uh, the advance during that, you know, because remember, it, it all was over within, what, four days? Yeah. yeah. And, it, you know, it was over in four days and we pulled so, up short of Baghdad. Uh, so, but, you know, we did we did the... Stuff in Central America and and training was almost nonstop. Yeah, yeah. And you know that's one thing about the battalions you didn't have to worry about you know being bored, getting fat and sassy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they keep you hard, huh? So so you you were in regiment until what point? At what year? And then you decided to go and in, into medical field. 
Uh, How no. did that transition begin? No, I, I was, I actually, uh, it's kind of funny. I, I, when I left 1st Battalion, I had to go to the Infantry Officer Advanced Course. That's where you kind of learn how to be a company commander and a battalion staff officer. Mm -hmm. So I went back to uh, um, the uh, Fort Benning for, you know, another round of higher education in the military. <laughs> um, and uh, unfortunately, the battalion commander was my history teacher from West Point, And um, he, he liked Army Rangers. So all the guys that had come in from battalion, they, they, they turned us into the chain of command. And uh. I was unfortunately the class commander, which just meant I had far less free time. Yeah, you, you you leave the time. Isn't that funny how that is, works? You work your ass off. You work hard enough, and you get more work put on you. Yeah, yeah. and and of course, classic. Uh, as, as soon as I got tabbed for that, I immediately reached out and grabbed two of my closest friends and made them the XO and the S three because you know you you want to share the suck yeah. with your closest <laughs> so friends. So well, together, congratulations. <laughs> yep, you've been and, promoted. Uh, uh, but I, there was a lot. I mean, a lot of folks during that time frame after uh, Desert Storm that. You know, we had trained and trained and trained and we had done all these things and, you know, basically the war blew by you. Yeah. And, you know, for a lot of the guys that were in the, more con in the conventional units, they sat in the desert for almost a year in mop level four. Doing nothing. And yeah. e eating uh, MREs. And, I mean, it was amazing the number of fat lieutenants that showed up at, <laughs> at the Infantry Officer Advanced Corps because they, they weren't able to do PT yeah. and they were just eating MREs all day and they were bored to tears. So eating, yeah. you know. It was it was it was kind of ludicrous. So there was a. And they probably uh, hadn't hadn't taken a shit in three years. Too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> eating MREs, you know, yeah. eating nine thousand calories a day, uh, sitting in mop gear. But uh, no, it's just it's just funny how the regiment works because at that time I you know I, I was kind of like oh maybe I need to look into something else, and um, so I had applied to the FBI at that point in my life, mm -hmm. um, and I, I went through all of it, it, it. Most people don't understand the 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 process. Yeah. Involved in that, the number of interviews, tests, PT tests, yeah. and and everything. Um, obviously, a very elite organization, just based on what you have to go through to get Enter. even close to it. Yeah. And uh, I just remember, uh, I finally, you know, I was, I was applying through the Atlanta office, and I finally got said, yep, we, we want you. And I'm like, okay. Hey, guys, if I graduate the officer advance course, I, I incur a... You know, uh, 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 I incur like two year, another year of yeah another, sort of duty yeah debt. Yeah. Uh, so I need to know when my class date was. Well, they were kind of waffling on the class date, and um, I was at that time. There was a big uh, big thing in the United States Army that if you were a light infantry officer as a lieutenant, they sent you to a mechanized unit um, as a free command because yeah, they yeah. wanted you trained in both sides of okay. light and heavy. In theory, I mean, it's actually not a bad bad theory, but. Yeah. For a guy like me that, you know, I had Humvees and I hated the motor pool with a passion, almost a second to jumping out jumping of airplanes. Out. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, so, I, you know, I was, I was headed to the 24th Infantry Division with my best friend, Mike Mathis. And um, I, I was not really happy about that because um, those are the guys that we made fun of in first bat all the time. Yeah. You know, living in the motor pool, turning wrenches and that sort of thing. And uh, I got a, I came back to class after lunch one day and there was this little note on my desk in front of me and it just said see me in a G and that was you know and I'm like I look down at it and I'm like oh okay and I walk up to the teacher the small group instructor and it's just like you know being in a high school classroom you know you, I said hey I have to go see uh, I showed him the note and he's like look at it, what, what the hell does that mean and I said oh I'm sorry it says see me and that G means Grange yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> they, they, and I, I know that G anywhere yeah yeah. <laughs> uh, Dave Grange was the uh, regimental commander yeah at that time uh, he had, um, so he'd actually gone full, you know, he'd become the range of regimental commander at that mm -hmm. time. And uh, I, I, he said something to me and I was like, I looked at him and I said, sir, I, with all due respect, when you get a note like this from that man, you're already late. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, you should have assumed that from yeah. the beginning. You know, I shouldn't have stopped to tell you where yeah, I'm going. Like yeah. I'm, I'm already in trouble just having yeah. spoke to you. <laughs> See me. Running right now. I mean, yeah, the initial <laughs> thoughts that you have to, after that one. Huh? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I race over to the regimental headquarters and, you know, I run to the, you know, back to the commander's office and um, his secretary said, oh, yeah, and passed me through and he was getting ready to go someplace and he just looked at me and, um, uh, you know, he just, uh, he said, oh, hey, Don, I uh, heard that uh, you were, uh, you know, um, being assigned down to the 24th Infantry Division. He said, I, I can't let that happen. He said, so I talked to, uh, you're going to get orders to first PERSCOM. And, uh, but don't worry about it. It's not, you're not going to be staying in Germany because all the units in Germany were also mechanized. 
Mm. He said, it's, it's just going to be a flow through and you're going to be pulled down to Vicenza, Italy to the Airborne Battalion Combat. Mm. Uh, John Abizade uh, is commanding down there. And I told him that, uh, you know, he, 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 well, he said he had a job for you. So, you know, the, the assignment to Vicenza, like in the academy, the only thing harder to get than into medical school is to get one of the two slots to the uh, Airborne Battalion mm. Combat Team of Vicenza. So, I mean, it was the... yeah. And, you know, put that in culmination with the fact that the Bureau was not willing to tell me. I mean, my class day could have been anything from the day after I, you know, left to two years down the road. Yeah, yeah. yeah it could, be. Know, it could and, be up to four years. I yeah, mean, yeah. yeah, it's just an un, just a big unknown. So you made a pretty big impact with Colonel Grange then, obviously, if he's I, pulling strings for you at that level. No, the, one of the things, and Dave can tell you this, is um, in the military, when in higher level units and that sort of thing, if you get there and you do your job. Yeah. And you don't even have to shine. I mean, just do your job, prove yourself to be loyal, prove yourself to be efficient, and you can accomplish the mission. And not being the brightest bulb in the box, I didn't question most any. Or Says any the doctor, by the way. Says you know, <laughs> the doctor. And, and, uh, <laughs> so. Psst. Kayla, did you know with Black Rifle Coffee's Coffee Club subscription, you can get fresh coffee shipped to you every month? What? You don't even have to go to the store. Whoa. You don't even have to leave your bed. What? Wow. How did you get in here? You might want to go ahead and join the Black Rifle Coffee Club subscription before one of these guys shows up at your place. And these guys tended to, if you worked hard for them, they, 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 the really good commanders looked out for for their guys, and it wasn't just me. I mean, he, 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 he did this for all sorts of officers mm -hmm. that you know had worked for him, and you know, in the past, and that sort of thing. It was just part of what the really good commanders yeah. did is if you worked hard people. for them, they, 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 they took care of you to the best of their ability. And Dave Branch was one of the finest officers that ever served in the military, and he, I, I just happened to be lucky enough that. I, I, I fit under his umbrella for a period of time. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he did, you know, try to help me have a military career. Mm. I, I think the number one reason that guys get out of the military that especially like uh, I can only speak to West Point graduates at the five year mark is uh, if you actually interviewed him and talked to him, most of the ones that had really phenomenal commanders mm. are the ones that stayed. I mean, yeah. it's, you know, it, it, the commander, the command climate, you know, just the way that you feel about being a soldier is, is not defined by the commander uh, really determines, I think, a lot of your satisfaction or, you know, whether or not you're going to be in the military. And I, it does, yeah. I, I, I was, you know, uh, I was just very fortunate, blessed, whatever you want to call it, that I just had really, really great commanders. Yeah. Um, because it just takes one bad commander to, to, to turn somebody off completely. Absolutely. To, to staying in. And I just good fortune. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that I just had fantastic bosses and yeah. uh, touch yeah. of luck. And, and so you got assigned to the combat team. Yep. And then what, what, what was that like for you? I mean, it was, uh, it was terrifying because the Airborne <laughs> Battalion combat team at that time was a brigade sized element, but they called it a battalion. Yep. Um, so, I mean, they had a howitzer battery. They had heavy engineers, light engineers. Mm. It was well over uh, like 23 or 2,400 men, but yeah. they still called it a battalion. I mean, and had one of the biggest logistic tails in the military because it was supposed to be an independently. It had 55 ton trucks, you yeah. know, for wow. logistics. Um, and I, of course, I, I mean, I, I'd been a rifle and a scout platoon leader, then a ranger platoon leader. I mean, logistics to me was an MRE and access to water. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is a different may, scale. Maybe, maybe call it a resupply yeah. for some bullets or something like that. Yeah. And I just remember I, I got there and I was supposed to be the S3 Air, mm -hmm. which was something that, you know, with a little bit of training from, you know, my NCYC and a few other people, I would have probably been, you know, kind of suited to work at because I, you know, I've been, been doing that sort of thing. And okay. uh, unfortunately... Um, I was standing outside the office of Colonel Abizade, Um, and, you know, John Abizade went on to command all the U.S. forces in um, Iraq mm. during OIF. He was a brilliant man. I think he had a couple of PhDs from Stanford. He wow. spoke uh, two or three dialects of uh, Arabic fluently. He was Lebanese himself. Wow. Um, just once again, I had I, I had bosses that most people only dream of. Yeah. yeah big and uh, he, he, he was known for his... Uh, volatility though but he was volatile with love yeah <laughs> <laughs> and uh 
No, this hurts me more than it hurts you. <laughs> no, no, it hurt you a lot. Worse than it hurt, uh, he, he could actually, you know, yeah, he could make you bleed with just his tone of voice. Uh, um, the, uh, but uh, Colonel Abizade was um, actually the guy that had picked me up at the airfield, you know, and brought me in and was kind of my sponsor. Um, okay. And uh, he, he was the S4 of the air room, which was probably the worst job to have because of the logistics. You know, they like probably had like five or 600 men assigned to the S4 shop. Yeah. Over there, um, mechanics. We still had the old field MKTs that take care of entire battalion feeding. And I was waiting to go into his office, and the guy in the office in front of me was my first friend in the, in Vicenza. And uh, he, uh, I, I didn't realize it until I heard the elevated tone of voice from the boss that uh, he, he was in the process of uh, relieving him of his duty. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, and job, and I, apparently it turns out that he was about the seventh S four in a row over there that had not gone to full term, yeah, uh, due to the horrendously huge size of the unit. Yeah, um, it seems like a massive amount of logistics yeah, you'd be was. dealing with. And uh, I'm still standing outside the office, and of course I'm I'm losing water from every orifice that I possibly <laughs> have. And uh, you know, and then he calls for the S three and. Uh, the XO, and they, they go to his office, and he's like, I need a new S4, and I'm this, that, and the other thing. And it's like he looks at Major Gilder, and he goes, didn't you just get a new lieutenant in? <laughs> and uh, Or a new captain in? And uh, he said, yes, sir. Uh, you know, Captain Crawford is just is out your side of your office right now. Good. Send him in. And I became the S4 of the Airborne Battalion Combat Team with absolutely no hope of success. Yeah. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, I just, you know, the only thing I had going for me was my dad was an NCO, and uh, he he did teach me a little bit about what to look forward and, you know, in, in NCOs. And I went down there and I met my NCOIC and it turns out that he had been the same NCOIC. He's one of those guys that went to Vicenza and he lived there. He'd been there like 15, 17 years. Oh yeah. Just yeah. Married, married somebody and he was just there the whole time. And he'd yeah. been the S4 of the, the whole time. And the, the only thing that rang out, out of that, about that to me was, you know, this is the same NCOIC that has allowed seven of my predecessors to get fired. Yeah. Yeah. He's the consistent factor. Yeah, he is he is the <laughs> he, is, <laughs> yeah. he is the common denominator. So I I, I went to, you know, uh the uh the command sergeant major, uh a guy named uh, Teddy Harmon. He lives here in San Antonio. He's once again a finer human being you'll never meet than Command Sergeant Major Harmon. Yeah. And I went to him and I just kind of very politely, because as Dave can tell you, Command Sergeant Major only works for one person in an infantry battalion. That's the battalion commander. Mm. Oh, yeah. You know, at best, as a captain, he is there to provide guidance yeah. if, if asked respectfully. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah. so he, uh, and I just kind of expressed my concerns. Okay. That, you know, maybe it might be time to bring a fresh look into. Yeah. Shake it up a little shop. bit. Yeah. And uh, there was a lot of, uh, I mean, the big feeder unit. The Ranger Regiment for the Airborne Battalion Combat Team was the 82nd because it was affiliated. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I ended up getting a, a young uh, E6 promotable that was burning up the, you know, burning up the charts um, with enthusiasm, energy, and knowledge. So the best thing that ever happened to me, of course, is I, I got a new uh, NCOIC that was looking to succeed because yeah. He, had, yeah. he had aspirations. Makes sense. And, you know, and uh, th I did the next best thing that an officer can do when he has great NCOs. I got out of his way yeah. and, and just figured out how to facilitate him and all of the other NCOs I had down there getting their jobs done. Smart. Yeah, no, yeah. it was. Working and it, smart. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, because, you know, I knew what I didn't know and uh, yeah. I didn't know logistics. But, yeah, so uh, you, I mean, you got extensive experience, like, in all aspects of the military. I did. Like, that's that's phenomenal. So let's let's go into. I, I want to get into how you like you had this whole career and then ended up in medical. Okay. Well, I was um, command, and uh, I it was just kind of I was I was getting close to thirty, <laughs> and I'd already been accepted back to first ranger. Battalion. I'm sorry, he did this all before he was thirty. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I was. I, um, I was, uh, I had already been accepted to come back to first ranger battalion to be the S4. And then if I didn't get fired, uh, potentially command the company that I'd been a platoon leader in, which is as about as good as it can get for a, a young officer trying sure. to navigate forward. Uh, but I had always wanted to be a physician and, you know, I still kind of kept abreast of those things. And I just figured if I didn't at some point make the break, 
Mm. It just was never going to happen. I was just going to be an infantry officer for the rest of my career, yeah. which would not have been a bad thing. I mean, yeah. it's it's a great life. It's a great job. Yeah. But, uh, you know, really and truly after company command is, you know, Dave can tell you for, for an officer, the next command is a battalion command. And that's, you know, in a peacetime army, that's, that could be six, eight, 10 years down the road. Yeah. And the chances of getting a TO and E battalion, you have to, you have to be good, but you also have to be lucky. Really lucky. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, you, you, unfortunately a battalion, you know, commander can get fired for something that one of his, you know, like a, a bank robbery is committed, uh, you know, by like one of your subordinates, <laughs> oh, you know, in, in a battalion. <laughs> Are you referring like to a second rank battalion? <laughs> no, I would the... never talk about something like that. <laughs> and, uh, I heard it was the most like, effective. It was bank a, robbery. Very Marcus. efficient, very well timed and executed. Yeah. The police were very impressed. Yeah, were the FBI. <laughs> and I'm actually very good friends with the company commander over there from that time period. I know. Uh, and uh, and he was actually an ex. He had been a he had gone through platoon sergeant in first range of battalion. So he's. But things things can happen beyond any commander's control. Of course, of course, and, it was uh, your fault, yeah, and, Rick. No. <laughs> like, yeah. and so you know, it was it was a big. So I figured it after you know I was at that. I was at that Y at fork in the road. Yeah. And uh, once again, having had great commanders and I went in to seek counsel from my boss who had this time was now a guy named uh, Benjamin Mixon. Um, and, uh, you know, I sat down with him and he, ex, you know, he'd been in the Ranger Battalion, you know, same pathway that everybody over there had been. And uh, he's like, yeah, you know, he said, uh, he said, if that's your, if that's your calling, if that's what you really want to do, he said, I, I will help you do that. Mm. He said, you couldn't have a better glide path set up for as an infantry officer right now, but mm -hmm. I understand that that's something you've always wanted to do. As good commanders do, they, you know, they, they try to facilitate people finding there. Um, and he, uh, and he did. Um, but he did put a caveat on it. He's like, if you, if you do, he said, I fully expect you to get the training and then come back and take care of soldiers. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. He said, I do not, you know, and, um, you know, I fully expect you to come back and take care of soldiers. And, you know, kind of, once again, I, I said, yes, sir, I will. And yeah. fully meant it. I mean, you don't. It's a fair agreement. Too. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. And, and, and he did because I was uh, it, unheard of. But I think I was out of the United States Army in 22 days from Vicenza, Italy, and, uh, wow. and, and, and attending classes in Philadelphia. <laughs> wow. Um, That's a quick turnaround. That is yeah, a quick turnaround. I mean, and that, and that took, you know. That took my boss calling in favors from his bosses yeah. and pushing yeah. things through, um, you know, like I said, an unheard of rate. Um, so Man, that's, um, that's insane. So, and you, you graduated medical school in 1998? I graduated medical school in 98. 98. Yes, so this was a couple of years before 9-11. Yes. So you're already, are you back in the military full swing of things. Yes. I mean, I, I, uh, my, my third and fourth year of medical school, I predominantly spent at Fort Sam Houston at Brooklyn Army Medical Center. Okay. Uh, because it's all rotations in medical school. It's mm -hmm. just, you know, and the military has great educational rotations for medical students. And so, so you had to be finishing up residency close to 9-11. Correct. Yeah. And so, so that, that whole, that's a whole nother story. So like what happens? So you're, you're in the medical field, your residency is complete. 9-11 happens. Right. How do you feel? I, I was standing in the gym, um, the 281 uh, racquetball and fitness. You've been there before it closed. <laughs> um, holding my wife's hand. We've just been married a year. Um, and uh, we're watching on TV. We're watching planes fly into the towers. Yeah. I think we stood there. We, sat, we, we actually stood there for like three hours mm. without moving, just watching this little TV in the corner, of, you know, on the wall in the gymnasium yep. and knew that the world was going to change. Yeah pretty dramatically after yeah. that. And uh, I, I was fairly um, confident or convinced or knew that for whatever reason, this was where I was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. um, I had chosen emergency medicine, which was a four-year you know, four residency in the, one of the nation's premier trauma centers. I'd received the best training from the best physicians in the world. Um, and we took care of a lot of you know, San Antonio is a big city, a lot of knife gun trains, you know, all the <laughs> bad things human beings can do to each other. Yeah. yeah. So it was a phenomenal training program. Um, I mean, it was number one in the nation under uh, Colonel Al Morgan for years. Mm -hmm. uh, he was our program director. I mean, he's a phenomenal mm -hmm. educator. Um, but there I am, you know, 9-11 and the, uh, have this training. I have this prior history of, you know, having been an infantry officer and yeah. I have this training as a physician and, there's an organization out of, uh, you know, Fort Bragg 
um, you know, and the Joint Special Operation Command has a, you know, medical support unit. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I talked to, you know, talked to them and they were kind enough to bring me on board, mm-hmm. which began my career, you know, the next phase of my life, which was predominantly um, going down range with, um, with that organization supporting the guys in the field. Okay. So is this, this is primarily like SF guys then or? Well, SF guys, um, they have their own physicians and okay. sometimes we did work with them, but this is, uh, was the joint, joint special operations Jason, command, yeah. which was predominantly the, um, tier one units, okay. uh, you know, from Fort Bragg and gotcha. more Rangers and stuff, that sort of thing. More specialized. Yeah. Yes. Tracking. So you, you see 9-11 happen. How, how close after that happened, were you out the gate and overseas? I, I remember having dinner with my wife that night. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was a pretty day. It was pretty. It was pretty quick. I mean, there was, yeah. you know, things things spun up very fast. Uh, and sometimes, you know, there was you know more overspin than, mm-hmm. but they they reached out and grabbed everybody mm-hmm. and you know prepared for the big. And then there was, you know, there was a pause while everybody, you know, where they actually started to identify plans and targets and things of that nature. But, um, you know, we all, you know, we started in Afghanistan. And uh, then in 2003, we, we, we started, you know, we moved into Iraq in April. Right. And um, it was, uh, there was a limited number of guys that did what I did in this unit. But mm. uh, we, we had a surgical capacity as well as uh, emergency medicine physicians. And uh, we augmented the... In, in intrinsic medical assets for the these units, okay. and we provided a far forward uh, resuscitation and surgical capacity to them. Um, and as the everybody goes into war with you know the way they've trained, and mm-hmm. you know, um, you know, and they. But one of the things that like about training for war is normally the medical slice is something that is not heavily looked at. Um, because, you know, it's all about accomplishing the mission, getting to the objective, actions on the objective, yep. and that sort of thing. Um, most units do train it, but not, you know, to the level of when you actually have people that are seriously injured. How to respond and, and, appropriately. Yeah, and, and, and to work through it. So everybody was going through a growing phase yeah. on, you know, how we were going to, you know, because now we had real, you know, it was a real shooting war and people were getting hurt yeah. Quite, yeah. Quite, quite, quite frequently. and. You know, it, 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 it was, we became very valuable to these units in a very short period of time. Absolutely. Um, because they, they realized that we were good at what we did. Um, like just as they were very good at what they did. Um, and we, we, we provided, I mean, we lived with these guys. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When we went out, um, I mean, I crossed paths with Dave in the gym and, you know, when we were at the same, you know, it just, it, it's different. When you live with these people, you know, and, yeah. you know, I being an old, I was an yeah. older, older doctor, you know, uh, I was 37 when the war started, which in ranger land is, um, you know, basically a grandfather. Uh, <laughs> it is. It really is. You know, I was, I was as old, if not older than, you know, the, well, the battalion commanders from that time period have been the guys I've been platoon leaders with. Yeah. Um, so, but, you know, it, it was important because as a physician a, attached or serving these guys, mm-hmm. um, we have no command authority over them. I mean, I went, I did, I did missions where I was, I was a, you know, lieutenant colonel promotable, and I was working for a staff, a buck sergeant, sure. you know, as a yeah. team leader because I, I'm, I'm combat service support. Yeah. I mean, I am not. Yeah, your medical element. Yeah, and I, 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 at I, some point, you had to be just like, hey, dude, like, I know what I'm talking about, though. Mm-hmm. Like, maybe you should take this advice. I, I, I wish I could say that. Yeah, I really do. I mean, but I, when, when you're working, when, when, when I got down there. And was working with these guys. They really are that good at what mm-hmm. they do. Yeah. And to be perfectly honest with you, when things got bad, I was so busy doing what I do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it never really, I never had the time or the, even the, the, the reason to second guess how they were doing things. Mm-hmm. Because just the level of the commanders and the, the, NCO, the NCO leadership, you know, above and below me was just... So phenomenal. It showcases mm-hmm. the amount of trust you have in them yeah. to operate and, too. But like I said, it, it is it is kind of personal when because you you live with these guys, you work yeah. out with them, you eat with them, yeah. you get to know them, you know, because you know young guys, you know, come up and ask you silly questions, and 
you know, I, I try to tell the other young doctors that were rotating over there that, hey, these are 18-year-old kids. Yeah. You know, when they come up and they ask you if the uh, the instrument in the back of the men's fitness magazine actually makes your junk bigger, you know. <laughs> uh, you will get that question. <laughs> yeah, you, you will medically get that question. And I did on several occasions. and Several, not just one. <laughs> and you, uh, you know, but and you have to realize that it, they're, they're seriously asking that question. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you could have the, you know, the, the snide or the, you know, response to them or, uh, you know, be in some way condescending. But if you do that, you're, you've lost. I mean, it's gone. Because if, if you understand how any of these units that we support work, if, you know, you, the first time that you're too busy to take care of one of them or to take time to take care of one of them, he tells his fire team, his fire team lets yep. the squad know by dinner time. Everyone knows. Everybody knows that Doc's an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, and it's like a game of telephone too, right? It, 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 it just, yeah. it just permeates through. And you know, the, the one thing I will say about our units back is there's not a whole lot of second chances, mm. you know? You, yeah. It's, you but, know. What, yeah. And Christian could attest to this with me is like, once I've made my judgment, it's really hard to get back <laughs> on my good side. Right. Yep. <laughs> That's Rangers for you though. Uh, right. Is, we hold a grudge. <laughs> we do. And it's you, um, you, you have to be aware of, you know, what, what, you know, what, what these young guys are asking you mm. and that sort of thing. But I mean, the, the, the absolute height of my feeling like I was on this planet to do something meaningful was, uh, you know, when you got a guy hurt and you, you get him to the hospital mm -hmm. and he's telling the other doctors they can't touch him because only he could touch me. Yeah. Because they have that kind of faith in just yeah, you. They have that trust. And, I, trust. And, and I'm sitting there and I'm just sitting there telling them, it's like, you know, son, you, you've got to understand. You've got to go to the operating room. And this guy is very good at what he does, and I can't do what he can do. Mm -hmm. I'm not a surgeon. Yeah, so um, you, you have to instill that yeah, trust. Yeah, and, and, you know, but they still, you know, they, 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 you know they, they are latched onto you. They yeah. have that kind of faith in you. Yeah. Um, and, they, they, and they don't fully understand that not all doctors do every Everything. aspect of medicine. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and that sort of thing. I just remember, like, when I was a Ranger platoon leader one time where, walking down the street and we were happened to be in big army land and, um, you know, a, another Lieutenant walks by and I, I, I nod at him and, um, the young Ranger specialist that was with me, uh, didn't salute him. And, you know, we just kept walking and I just, you know, I kind of leaned over and I said, Hey, um, you know, you, you, you didn't salute that Lieutenant when he walked by and he looked at me with all honesty in his eyes and he said, this was a tab. I mean, this was yeah. the guy that had grown up in battalion. And he yeah. looked at me and says, sir, do, do we have to salute non-ranger officers? <laughs> <laughs> and, and of course, another one of those moments where I could have oh, gone any direction man. with that. Yeah. And I just looked at him and I, said, I just, you know, I just dropped my eyes and I said, I'm afraid so. <laughs> it may not, it may not be, it may not be fair. And you have to say it in such a way that he knows that in your heart, he believes that that officer should be saluting him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we volley this too. Yes. So, so let, me, let me ask you this. Uh, you, know, you know, you've spent all this time with these guys, these 18-year-old kids. How do you not let it get to you when these guys are getting injured, getting hurt, getting killed in action? Like, I mean, that's got to be tough to like separate that between you know, showcasing that to the other people in the unit. It's, it's, and I don't know how many times I've had this conversation with, especially with other doctors, I was trying to get ready to go do the yeah. types of mission that we, we did supporting the guys that we supported. And even sometimes the guys assigned a battalion, uh, first and foremost, you, it will get to you. Mm, yeah. if, if it doesn't get to you, you shouldn't be there. Yeah. I mean, of course. The, the, these are, but you can't show that. Well, and that's, that's the point is, you can to a little bit of extent, yeah. What you can't ever let them see or let ever let happen is let them see or let it impede you performing your job. Exactly. Yes. Okay. You know, you, yes, he got hurt. Yes. I am. I am crying. You know, I'm broken inside yeah, over hurt. this. I'm upset. Yeah. I'm but we need to ruck up and we need to get back on the helicopter and we need to go you know, even the score, Yeah, yeah. you know, for this guy. Um, so I always told guys never, if you pretend like it doesn't bother you, 
and if it doesn't bother you, you definitely I don't want to be around you. You got a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you are a little bit older. You are a little bit more mature. And these guys are looking to see what you do. Yeah. Okay. And if they have to see that, yeah, it affects you, but it doesn't impede you. Yeah. That you are able to, you know, and, and, and a lot of times, you know, you always ask about, you know, you guys use the word resiliency and that sort of thing. And a lot of resiliency is the next mission. It, it, you know, mm. you, you have, you, you know, I got to. Moving I, forward. I, I got to move forward. Yeah. Taking the next step. I, yeah. I got to continue the mission. I got to continue to march. Yeah. And, and not and just bask in it, right? What's and that? I think that if you bask in it yeah. and, you, and you don't move forward, that's when it defeats you, right? Correct. Yeah. If so you, the resiliency is, is overcoming that adversity that you're facing. Yeah. You, I, I've talked to people at the highest level. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, because of some unique experiences, you know, when, when PTSD was very big in the army and, you know, there's, there, there's quite a few, but not an overabundance of doctors that actually were in street, you know, in real combat sure. and take casualties and that sort of yeah. thing. And seeing it and living with the soldiers at the time. And then also being of high enough rank academically and, you know, militarily that you could talk to some of these folks that were trying to structure. And I, I always told them the same thing is, you know, PTSD is normal. Yeah. yeah. You, know, you don't take any human being or any 18 to 22 year old soldier and put him into that situation where you're asking him to do these things to other human beings, or he's seeing something horrible happen to somebody that he's very, you know, his, for all intents and purposes, closer to than his own brother. Sure. Yeah. Um, you, you will be affected by that. You will never forget that. Yeah. The, the question is with, you know, with PTSD, like I said, it being normal is, is that soldier able to continue on and soldier and accomplish yeah. the mission? Yeah. What do you do from there? What do you do from there? Yeah. How do you yeah. move forward from there? And that is, that is almost to me, is, is almost entirely a unit cohesion issue. Mm -hmm. um, it's a chain of command issue. Yeah. Because hmm. the, the young guys in the unit, I mean, the, the, the older guys, the, you know, the young privates, you know, the, the, the E4 with tabs, the team leaders. Yeah. They, they got to put their, you know, they got to put their hand around their shoulder. Yeah. And, and say, hey, it's okay, but we got to do this. Or, you know, they got to kick them in the ass. Whatever they got to do. Yeah, and, and yeah. I think that that's and, indoctrinated in a lot of these uh, these soldiers is, is, you're a man, you know, get over it, right? right? So when you say that it's a command, you know, ineptitude, it, it definitely is. It's like the way they treat it is they, they need to be like, okay, it's okay to feel this way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, tough but tender, we always say, tough right? Tough but tender. You, it's allow you're well, allowed to have emotions with it, but... If it, you know, takes away from you completing the mission, that's where the problem is. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we did, and I, uh, you know, I, I was with all the tier one units, but I was predominantly uh, was, you know, served with the the, 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 the rangers seemed to have the most use for me. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll just phrase it that way. They seemed to have the most use for me. Okay. Or at least put up with me, which, you know, at my age was something they were worried that they might have to carry me. Um, the uh, but when we lost somebody, um, we did. We took. We 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 did. We we took the time to remember them. We took the time to have the ceremony. We took the time to show them. And the one thing that every every young soldier knew in the regiment is if, if the worst thing happens, their family was going to be taken care of. Mm. The guys were going to come home, and they weren't going to be forgotten. Yeah. Um, and that that may be unique to our unit um, and the way we did things. But it does give you a certain amount of confidence yeah. that, yeah. you know, that if the worst does happen, you know, it's not just going to be the end. My, my family is going to be cut astray. And, you know, these guys are remembered and, yeah. you know, by the unit. And, you know, it, it, and that's what good units do. Yeah. Take care of each and, other. And, and they take care of each other. Yeah. And that, that starts at the commander and it, and it flows down through the entire command, you know, all the way down to the team leaders and to the, just the guys that have more experience than the other guys. Yeah, it's like you know we they, you have to take care of each other. Yeah, that's the sounding board. You know, you want to talk about group therapy? And group therapy is your fire team. Mm -hmm. You know, it's your squad. It can be okay. You yeah. know, if you need higher level counseling, you have a platoon sergeant. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and but that's the way good units work. Yeah, and it's not that you know that they they just come out and tell them to you know bite down on the stick and you know ruck up and move out. You know. I can tell you that platoon sergeant, that was one of his, for all intents and purposes, one of his children. Yeah. And he's just as broken inside about it as you are. Yeah. He just has the experience and the knowledge and um, 
the training, for lack of a better word, to know that we still have a mission to accomplish and we will be we will be hurting our member, you know, we will yeah. be dishonoring, you know, our brother yeah. if we don't continue to do what we've always done throughout history. They've got yeah. a responsibility. Yeah. And that's what, you know, that, and, and, I, and I try to t- tell, but commands can't structure that into an FM or into some sort of, yeah. um, you know, manual for on how to manage PTSD it's and kind the of military. Yeah. And it's like, you know, it's like, you know, what, 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 so what, what are you saying? I'm saying you got to be a good leader. And part of being a good leader is, Taking care of every aspect of your your troops' lives before and after, before, after, during every every, yeah. every minute of it. That's more of an art, I think, because yeah. there's no there's no manual dictating how to increase unit morale. There's no manual dictating how to increase unit cohesion and make people closer yeah. or happier, yeah. or want to yeah. operate better. It's, it's a, kind of an art, right? I, it truly is. I and think so. I mean, the, the, the hardest, yeah. you know, I, I, I there's I, recently this quote has come to mind. It was one of my commanders told me before I took command of a unit, an element that if your men fear you, and that's all they do is fear you, they will, they will desert you at the first, the first opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. If, if your men respect you, mm. they will, they will fight for you. Yeah, absolutely. But if your men know that you love them, they will die for you. Yeah. That is a very powerful statement. And I think, I couldn't agree more with you on that yeah. is, is you, you kind of yeah. stick, stick to the uh, leadership that you could count on yeah. at all, in all aspects. And, and that's, you know, a great leader doesn't have to be the guy that can run 20 miles in 15 minutes and he doesn't have to be, you know, look like, you know, it, it's not the great leader is the guy that can focus on the mission, accomplish the mission. And at the same time, every one of his soldiers knows that he's there for them yeah. Yeah. and he's right. He's, he's in it with them. And he'll do everything he can to bring them home alive while accomplishing the mission. Mm. Yeah, that's, yeah. you know, and like I said, there's no prototype for that. That's just, I think, that's a character. That's a, it is. That's something inside people. And the really great leaders get it that you can, you know, you can be, you know, you can totally love, you can push your soldiers and, and love, you know, that's, you know, it's, but that, that have that feeling for their soldiers. Mm hmm. Uh, I, I just, I spent a lot of time with one uh, company commander named Nathan Mollica. Mm-hmm. He just retired. Um, I just remember, you know, um, Nathan was, his, the way his men looked up to him. Um, you know, and he, he was a, you know, he was a, uh, he wasn't a minister, but he was a, you know, like, and he led, the, he led the prayers before battle okay. and the way he dealt with his soldiers when they were wounded. And I just, you know, every one of his soldiers knew that, you know, he loved them. Mm, yeah, and there was a, nothing. They if he if he walked up to him and said, "Hey, I need you to do this," there was no hesitation. Yeah, there was yeah. no, you know that. that, that like, yeah. it's like doing a favor for a friend at that point instead of taking an order yeah, from. Yeah, I mean, and and you and I, I just keep referring to Dave because we have similar background. But <laughs> you know, with young rangers, you have to be careful what you tell them. Mm. Yeah, I mean, my platoon sergeant told me that when I first became a ranger platoon leader, he said, "Sir, you got to be careful." You know, because I, I've got kind of a sarcastic kind of a weird person sense of humor sometimes and yeah. um I'm I'm referred to sometimes as irreverent um I have a <laughs> funny way way of looking at things but it, you know you're you're walking across the compound and you, you know you just you want to screw with somebody and rangers screw with each other all the time absolutely it, it is a that's, I think that's half the job art, I'm familiar full art, full art, <laughs> I troll you know? this guy all the time but you got to be careful cuz he's like hey that guy looked at wrong go kick his ass and you <laughs> yeah. know and he'll take off and take the dude down. He will, he will do it. <laughs> you know, and to him that, you know, he was just, like I said, you have to be careful what, you know, especially if you have a leadership role with these guys, because yeah. they are, they, they are trained to, you know. Kill. Yeah. And uh, they, well, they, they are trained to fight yeah. and they are, they're undeniably so fiercely loyal to each other and their unit that, you know, once again, they could hate somebody within the battalion with their whole heart, but they will slug it out next to that person to the death. Yeah. Um, before, you, that's what you do, right? You, yeah. you got a problem with somebody, let's go in the room, take yes. off our blouse and oh, you yeah. get out and your brother's at the end of it. Right. That's it. And, and unfortunately I had that mentality when I was, you know, a leader in medicine as well. <laughs> with civilians. And, you know, it, you're like, Hey, I'm going to take off my, uh, <laughs> my lap. Like, you really here. have a problem with this? Cause, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll step into the back right yeah. now. Yeah, you know. Sir, I'm just here for a headache. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> you know, the, uh, but no, it's like I said, it, it, it works. It works for them. Yeah. Right? It works for their culture. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think, I think that's amazing. So, so you did how many deployments as a medical doctor? 10. 10 deployments. Yeah. So, and you got out in? I retired in 2013. 2013. Mm-hmm. So, first and foremost, I got to say, where I met you, besides the gym overseas, yeah. right, is, is at Bamsey when I was doing my recovery there, and you yeah. were the trauma Well, I was, ER. the, I was, the, I was the, the chief of the emergency department. So you had to see, you know, all these roughed up guys coming in. Well, we, we had, at, at Bamsey, we had the Center for the Intrepid, yeah. and the uh, SOCOM, um, which the overall parent unit of all of the special operations guys, um, especially the guys with like your, you know, amputations and injuries that were going to require extensive rehab. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The Center for the Intrepid is the world's greatest facility. I mean, it was built just and, 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 and just staffed. for that purpose. You know, yeah, just yeah, it's, staffed. Uh, it's cutting edge research. It's cutting edge technology. Um, Dave, what do you got? You got like seven legs for different sports. And, yeah, that's right. I do. And, uh, <laughs> the, uh, no, it's amazing. I mean, I, I'm impressed every time I go by the place. Got one that can make me jump 30 feet? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it only, the, it uh, only can make you proficient in bed, right? Oh. <laughs> yeah, well, That's they have an impressive. attachment for that, I heard. Yeah. <laughs> the detachable yeah. kid? <laughs> but the, uh, uh, yeah. but um, so we, we, our, our soldiers weren't attached. Uh, they weren't attached to the uh, Warrior Transition Battalion, mm-hmm. which had its own internal chain of command and everything like that. Our, our guys were expected to be disciplined enough. They were sent there. They were there TDY. Yeah. And they, their mission, their, their duty when they were there was to get better and was to recover. And you can expect them to do that. And, and by and large, yeah. yeah. And, but as a, a colonel um, and officer that was, you know, my nighttime job was, you know, with the, the units. Mm-hmm. And my daytime job happened to be when I wasn't deployed at Bampsy. Um, they, they asked me to kind of look after everybody that came in. Sure. Uh, because sometimes navigating the, the hospital and the higher, because medicine is a completely different world than the military, especially when you hit a major academic facility like Bamsey. Yeah. yeah. It's a premier academic facility. Yes. But it is, it is, it, the only thing that it shares with the army in many cases is the uniforms. Yeah. And half the employees there are civilians anyway. Yes. Not a whole um, lot of tab doctors walking around there. Well, no. <laughs> and the, uh, and not at all. <laughs> the, uh, um, so there was, and there's, there's certain, you know, bureaucratic hurdles and that sort of thing. And, yeah. um, so being kind of an insider to both worlds, um, you know, I, I, I was able to make sure that my guys, you know, they, they were seen by, you know, I, I, I could steer them a certain, I, I could kind of, Guide Try to them. guide them into yeah, you uh, guide them and make sure that they were getting the best care and mm-hmm. and also make sure they were doing everything they could to um, properly shave. Yeah, rehab and everything. <laughs> You're gonna tell the story, I know. Uh, but the uh, yeah, and, and and normally the the senior wounded enlisted was kind of like the platoon sergeant, and he also kept tabs on everybody. Yeah. But by and large, I was only there for you know if they got in trouble, you know. Yeah. And they had to have, I mean, that's probably the first conversation you had when you showed up there. And I told you, if you know, you don't call your lawyer, you don't call your mom, you know. <laughs> call me. Call me first. You call me first. Yeah, that's right. I had and a direct number to you as well. That's, that's correct. That, that, that speaks volumes about your leadership methods as well. And, you know, and that's just, you know, because like I said, it's it's a different world. Yeah. And uh, I, I was a little bit more familiar with that world. Yeah. And there was, I mean, there, there was multifocal on a lot of things because I had to talk to young guys about, we as physicians, these guys have severely traumatic injuries that have tremendous amounts of pain associated with them. Yeah. And then we make them dependent on pain medications to help them because you don't rehab well if you're in severe pain. Exactly. Um, but at the end of that, when the, when the pain starts to diminish, we have, not, we have physiologically made you dependent on these medications. Mm-hmm. And we've got to navigate and get you off of them. And as Dave can tell you, that that's not... You know, there's a lot of guys that have problems with that, and, and rightfully so. Process. It is a difficult physiological thing to do. Yeah, I mean, just I mean, if, you know, from my own experience, you know, all the older guys downrange, we all had to take Ambien to sleep during the day because, yeah. and it's a benzodiazepine. It's yep. one of the most addictive medications on the planet, 
and you come back and you think you're going to taper yourself off of it, this, that, and the other. Nope, you're not. And you're not sleeping And we had meetings week. about it because we, we, we passed out Ambien. Like, like candy. Like, like candy. candy. Like candy. Uh, yeah. uh, because we did everything at night. So people had, like me, I was. Yep. You have to turn four, nocturnal. Four, I, I was 42, 43 years old toward the, you know, at, 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 and trying to keep up with the world's most physically, you know, fit young guys. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I had more braces and supports than, you know. <laughs> I, <laughs> the was, Golden Gate Bridge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, you, you can only do like one or two days in a row where you're getting four hours of sleep during daytime. Yeah. So, you know, you're taking this stuff so that you can get actual restorative sleep, which you need to be mission capable. Yeah. yeah. But when you come back and you got to reverse cycle and get back to daytime normal operation, you got to get off that stuff. Yep. It is heroically difficult. Yep. And we looked at it from every possible way to, you know, because everybody was on, you know, to deal with it. And, you know, the, the, the great, uh, the great medical outcome of all these great minds was, Hey, we just got to cut them off. <laughs> oh, smart. It's perfect. Go cold turkey. Go yeah. cold turkey on this stuff. Yeah, we're going to be because, good. Because yeah. nothing else works with, yeah. with benzo. I mean, yeah. it really just, doesn't. Just have to stop. There's no tape. Yeah, yeah it's you, just. And, and some of the funniest stories in the world come from when you quit. And I mean, we we cut people off when they when when, when you palletized your weapon to come home. It's like that's the last pill you got, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you would see it, you know, when we were getting ready to roll out. I mean, depending on you know when the when the plane came in, sometimes it was day, sometimes they have, sometimes the Jesus nut would break. Yeah. You'd be stuck on the ground for two. These guys would be walking around like zombies for two and a half days yeah. without oh, yeah. sleep yeah. Yeah. and everything like all. that. But then it, then it catches up to you. Yeah. yeah. You know, and then it's, you freaking, you know. And it's you, better to you, do it while you're still deployed instead uh, of doing it yeah, when you get home. Because uh, I had that I had that horror yeah. story where I, uh, you know, I left country. I stopped. And I, it was amazing. I, I mean, I, I came out of a mission where it was kind of, it got a little sporty. Okay. And we were busy. And, you know, I came back and the plane was on the ground. And uh, my replacements were there. And uh, I mean, I, you know, basically they had already packed up my crap. Nice. <laughs> and, I, you know, and I, you know, and I, I'm handing, you know, my stuff. And I mean, I barely had time for a shower and I was, you know, wheels up. That's a had, quick turnaround. Had, and it was an aerial refuel. So we, you know, the, the time to get back to, to, to Fort Bragg was like 16 hours yeah, or something. 16, like that. 18 you know, hours. Just yeah. Like, you know, and then I get to Bragg and, you know, we had the best support guys there. You know, my buddies at the unit, they, um, I'd, I'd been deploying a lot. So they, they were taking, you know, trying to help me get home. And mm. my wife was also expecting. And, uh, okay. You know, just once again, the things guys do for each other, yeah. you know, to, to expedite. And, uh, well, long story short, I, I'm on the plane. I finally make my connection out of Atlanta to San Antonio. And somewhere mid flight, you know, it wore off. All right? <laughs> and I mean, I'm, you know, I'm out. Yeah. I, I am completely out. And, uh, and I, uh, I, I remember waking up in San Antonio and, you know, you wake up a little differently when you've been deployed oh, yeah. quite yeah. a few times. Absolutely. You normally, you wake up kind of semi startled, but still a little and karate sit, hacking people in the neck, you, left you know, and right. Well, no, you're just and then you, you're <laughs> trying to evaluate what's going on around you. Is it a mortar attack? Is it, you know, yeah. did I oversleep and missed SP? Well, you know, yeah, yeah you but, wake but, up but so disoriented, this, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, but there's always a sense of panic associated yeah. oh, with it. Oh, of course. You know, and, I still wake up like that. Yeah. This guy's like, why are you screaming? <laughs> <laughs> Every morning. <laughs> and, and, and I wake up and I got two flight attendants and like the co pilot. You know, hovering over me on an empty plane. <laughs> okay, and, sir. And I'm like looking up, you know, and I'm like trying to evaluate because <laughs> trying to keep your shit together. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like figuring to try to figure because I had no clue where I was at. Yeah. You know, Doing the calculations in your head, like, <laughs> like uh, so I got to fight my way out of this. So, you know, it's like this flight attendant yeah. looks a little fishy. Yeah. And 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 then they the guy's looking at me. He's like, "Are you okay?" And I'm like, "Yes." And he goes, we, we were a little concerned. We know you're a soldier, and, but we couldn't wake you up. Uh, oh. We, you know, you wouldn't wake up. But, you know, the flight attendants, they came and got me. We were, you know, and they were actually about 30 seconds away from calling an ambulance oh. because yeah. I would not wake up. I mean, I, when I passed out from the, you know, wearing when the, when they finally cleared my system, yeah, you know, and I blacked out. I mean, I was out and there was no coming back and. You know, so I wake up to that scenario where I could that that, that would have just been a perfect landing for yeah. me. You know, right. yeah. an ambulance. You know, the waking up. The attendant ambulance. came up to me and said, "Do you want some warm nuts?" <laughs> and I karate hacked her. <laughs> so, <laughs> it could it, be it, the story. You know, but but that's what you know. So 
back to where we were at, you know, taking care of these guys over there. Sometimes I had to have conversations with them and help them in, in other ways. Yeah. yeah. Deal with, you know, getting off of this stuff. The dependency. You know, yeah. and because it's, it's tough. Yeah, I, I struggled with that along. They, they handed out Ambien like candy yeah. on yeah. all of our deployments, oh, yeah. especially when we were in really austere areas. They would just give you a pile of it and like, yeah. here's for your deployment. Yeah. No, every and time we load it up and go is. over, yep. I mean, we, we got like a couple briefcases full of it to resupply the, yep. you know, yeah. boxes of crap. And I, I think that that speaks paramounts about your character as well as you have the extensive background that people are going to listen to you, right? As a ranger, knowing that you're a ranger and you were in the shit with them, you know, prior to your medical service and all that, and then being alongside them with that kind of training, like, of course they're going to listen to you. And, it, it, you know, it, when you relate to somebody on that scale, well, you're going to be a great leader well, in that environment, especially. I don't know about all that. I appreciate that. But I mean, I don't know about all that. But I do know that when, when you got a guy in a hospital situation, and there's probably nothing harder on a really high-end operator to, than to be hurt. Yeah. I mean, because Drop his guys it. are still out there doing the deed. Yeah. He's not participating anymore. There is just an overwhelming sense of guilt and anguish and, you know, about the fact that he's not, you know, there with him. Yeah. Not there and for his buddies. Yeah. The, when, when, when somebody comes up and just starts talking to him about, oh no, you've got to accept this. You've got to accept that. This is just the new reality and everything like that. And, you know, they're, they're wearing a uniform, but you can, you know, that's one thing about the military. You can tell a lot of proud person when he walks up to you. Yep. Um, and, you know, if I was having that conversation with somebody and I, I you know, I, I, I had a scroll on my right shoulder. Um, it was more of a conversation than these guys could zero you out. I mean, it's amazing to watch these professionals just absolutely mm -hmm say all the right things, but you know that they're completely <laughs> turned off. <laughs> they are switched off, yep. you know, inside. Uh, and sometimes it takes even, you know, like for me, um, sometimes it would, and the other thing is persistence. You know, sometimes I, I could, I could walk away and I said, yep, uh, we're going to have to revisit this <laughs> <laughs> sooner yeah. than later, yeah. you know, um, and that sort of thing. But that's another way to show you that you care uh, yeah. is because when, when you're, when you're going at a guy or sitting down with him for the third or fourth time, he figures out either you're just the world's biggest asshole and you get off on this or you might actually give a shit. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you might be right. And we're, we're hoping that it's, you know, you, when you, you crest the bridge to the give a shit. Yeah. Uh, the ladder. Yeah, yeah the ladder absolutely. Too. So you retired what year? I was hired in 2013. What are you doing now? Um, I, I spent a lot of time still working at the MAMC Emergency Department as a contractor. Mm -hmm. Kind of retired from that a year ago. Um. And now I work in, in community community hospitals, and I'm just, yeah. uh, I guess my new war is uh, COVID and the anxiety about COVID. Mm. A whole nother podcast for that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, I'm just going to call you uh, Modest Don here now, because this guy is the most modest <laughs> yeah. doc I've ever met in my life. And I'll tell you what, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the podcast today, and I could probably talk for We're gonna, okay. I think we should have you back on. <laughs> Definitely have you back on again. Happy to be here, guys. Yeah. Yeah. I, really yeah. I mean, really thank I mean, you. Next time, six pack of beer and we'll just get it done, yeah. huh? There's some really good coffee in this facility. There is. <laughs> yeah. Black Rifle That's Coffee. Great. Black Rifle Coffee plug. That's great. Don, right. thank you so much for joining the show today. One quick thing. You know, if you had one thing to tell our audience out there, what would it be? You need to really keep a warm place in your heart for the guys that are willing to go overseas and put it out there on the line to keep you safe. Couldn't agree more. That's, you know. That's, that's how it should be. I mean, yeah. these guys are defending yeah. and, and our freedom. They're, and they're, they're giving up their personal freedom and they're, yeah. they're, they're scared as hell. And, uh, you know, that, and, and they, don't, they don't come back the same. Yep. You know, you don't put these, uh, these young men and women through this and expect them to come home the same. So their, their sacrifice is, you know, so most people can't comprehend. Uh, you know, it's nice when people say thank you for your service, but. It's even better when people say thank you for your service and they mean it. Yeah. Uh, so. Agreed. Agreed. You know, Dave's Dave's yelling at me for you uh, pinching that can over there. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Donald Crawford. Yeah. You've been a fantastic guest today. Thank you so much for what you do. Thanks for continuing to serve and helping our nation's heroes and our civilians as well. Yeah. Glad to be here, guys. Yeah, Appreciate really, you inviting me. Thank you. 
This has been the Medivac Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, if you enjoyed today's episode, please share it with a friend, family member, or a stranger. Thank you guys for joining. Thank you guys. <laughs>